Charisma. How are we all doing today? Win or lose, how are we all doing today? Welcome to our church. We are continuing our series called Journey with Jesus. You know, following Jesus is a journey. There's some ups and there's some downs. There's some zigzags. There's some uh, accidents. There's, it's part of the journey. But as long as we have Jesus, we'll be okay. Amen? Amen. Well, I want you to take out your message note because I want to share a, a message personally to me. This builds me up. And I hope this will encourage all of you today. I want you to look at uh, the stage right now. And we're going to play a game. This is called Will It Float or Will It Sink? Everybody say with me, Will It Float or Will It Sink? Say it again. One, two, three. Will It Float or Will It Sink? I want to use this as a visual illustration for my message today. So... What do you think? This item going to drop in this aquarium. Will it float or will it sink? sink. Where's your faith? <laughs> oh, you see it's standing. What about this one? This is the number one selling canned food in Hawaii. <laughs> will it float or will it sink? Still standing, right? <laughs> okay, let's try it harder. An egg. What do you think? Will it float or will it sink? Will it float? Are you kidding me? <laughs> let's, let's, this one is harder. Will it float or will it sink? Huh? See the persistence of this object? They're still standing, right? Yeah. What about this? Will it float? Will it sink? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> what about this guy? Probably some of you are disappointed with this guy. Russell Wilson. <laughs> will it float or will it sink? Come on, guys. Do you think Russell could bounce back from that uh, heartbreaking loss? Oh! Woo! But not just Russell Wilson. How about the Seahawks? Do you think the Seahawks can bounce back? Do you think it will it float or will it sink? Whoa! Now here's the point. This is a metaphor of your life. All of us will be devastated. All of us will experience some setbacks, failures. Will you stay down or will you float? Because some people, when they experience a major tragedy or setbacks in their life, they don't have the ability to make a comeback. Listen to me carefully. Your personal victory in life is directly connected with your ability to bounce back up right after a major fall. I want to take your attention to the Bible and ask this question, will it float or will it sink? Mark chapter 6. I want you to take your Bibles with you or open it or look at the screen right now. Let's read it all together. Read it aloud. Corinthians 1, 2, 3. When evening came, the boat was in the midst of the sea. He was alone on the land. He saw them straining at rowing for the wind and waves were against them. Will it float 
or will it sink? Let me give you the setting or the background. Look at this, the picture. This is up north of Sea of Galilee in Israel. It's snowing. It's like Mount Rainier, right? You go to Mount Rainier where there's summer, winter, spring, or fall, there's still snow. There's a place in Israel up north of Sea of Galilee. It's snowing there all year round. And down south is a Judean desert. It's below sea level. It's hot. It's muggy. It's dry weather. And it's like 100 degree weather right there. Could you just imagine this? Up north, there's snow, and down south, it's heat wave. And what a perfect recipe that the water or the moisture or the air coming from the north and the south, it will meet in the middle of Sea of Galilee. And no wonder, whilst the Sea of Galilee is known for notorious tsunamis, typhoons, and all of a sudden, oh, big waves. Before, during the time of Jesus, and even today. Look at the news a few years back. Tiberius destroyed 20 dead at Jewish city at Sea of Galilee. So now you have a visual picture. Jesus' disciples were rowing to the other side of the lake, and all of a sudden, high winds or strong winds and high waves buffeted this ship, and they were just straining. Look at the verse again. Let's read this again so that you have a mental picture. Can we put, put the, the, the memory verse again in Mark chapter 6? Let's read together, Charisma. When evening came, the boat was in the midst of the sea. He was alone on the land. He saw them straining at rowing. The word straining means going on circle, going nowhere. They got stuck. And will they float or will it sink? You know, one of the hardest experiences in life is being stuck. How many of you have the experience of being stuck in the traffic along 405 or in I-5? How many of you experience being stuck waiting in line, right? When you go to the grocery stores, do you look at the shortest line? And sometimes you even count the 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 stuff in the grocery cart of those people because you don't want to be waiting in line. How many of you get stuck in a habit that you're trying to beat? You know, I want to use today this acronym STUCK and explain to us why it's so hard to get stuck and why do we get stuck. Letter S stands for suffering. Everybody say suffering. How, how many of you, when you suffer, it's not a happy feeling, Amen. You hate it, right? And when you suffer, it's heart-wrenching. And you know what's really sad about suffering is letter T. Suffering comes with trauma. That's why we have this saying today or of findings in the medical field, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's like a flashback of what happened before and it's still fresh in your memory and you're suffering from trauma. And I'm sure some of us today are suffering from the trauma of how our Seahawks lost. You know, I was calling my coach the next day. I just need some uh, encouragement. I called my coach and the secretary said, I'm sorry, he's out for the day and probably for a week. <laughs> Why? He's depressed right now. <laughs> and I called my pastor friend. And let's go out and have lunch together. And he hosted a Super Bowl party too. He hosted a Super Bowl party too. And, and when Curtis caught that miraculous catch, and I said, oh, it's a miracle. And all the students ran toward the big giant screen and took out their camera phone for the next play. And all of a sudden, they got stuck. <laughs> they were not even to press the button. I said, what happened? It's traumatic, right? And some of you are laughing at us right now. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, trauma is, you get stuck there. And another thing is hard when you get stuck is, you know what? Sometimes you're unwilling to call on God. Check this out. The disciples, they just witnessed a miracle. 
Jesus fed 5,000 people with few loaves of bread and two fish. Right after the miraculous display of God's power, God said, go ahead. Go to the other side and I'll meet you on the other side. No one even bothered to pray. Listen to me carefully, Charisma. When you are stuck and you're unwilling to call on God, you get deeper in the dumps. Come on, somebody. The more you get discouraged. And that's what happened to the disciples. They're just doing their best, straining and rowing. Probably they're saying, hey, fishermen, we're professional. Peter, James, John, this is our field. This is our turf. We know the Sea of Galilee. We pass by this side so many times. No one bothered to pray. And here's another problem, church, with being stuck. Get comfortable staying stuck. It's like a doctor asking a patient, would you like to get out of your depression? Or would you like to get out of that pain? And sometimes you say, I don't know. I don't know what happiness means. I don't know. I, this is a new normal for me. And sometimes we get stuck in the pain and we make a pet out of it. And another reason why we get stuck in life, I believe this is very important. Let's read this together. Cap looking back. Let's read it again. Charisma, one, two, three. Keep looking back. Now, here's the thing, Charisma. You have two choices. Look back and compare or look ahead and dream again. You could look back and rehearse that scenario, rehearse that event, and replay it like looping thoughts in your brain. And then you compare coulda, shoulda, woulda. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. What if? There's no point of asking those questions because it's done. It's in the past. You cannot change it. Come on, somebody. No matter how much you try to replay it, the outcome is already there. You could look back and compare or you could look ahead and dream again. Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. Look ahead and dream again. You know, one of the wisest men said this, and I would like to quote it to all of us. This is the summary of life. Let's read this together. Life is understood backward. Let's read it again. Life is understood backward, but live forward. We learn from our past. The past is a good teacher, but it is a bad, bad, bad master. We just take a glance and look back. It's like when you are driving, you look at the windshield. It's wide. Every now and then, you look at the rear view mirror to see where you come from and to see if there's a police behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just kidding. But the, the, the windshield is wide. And some of us keep looking back. That's why we cannot move forward. And here are some five facts about discouragement. You know, you, you, discouragement is universal. Everybody say it, universal. Universal. It happens to good Christians. It happens to non-Christians. It happens to the rich, the poor. It happens anywhere and everywhere. It's universal. There's no place on earth that there's no such thing as, as full-time happiness. No, 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 no. And you know one thing I learned about discouragement too? It is not just universal. It's repeating. It's repeating. It doesn't happen once and then you're free from it. No. Every now and then, the devil knows when you're weak and then he'll attack you with discouragement and condemn you. It's repeating. You know one thing we know about discouragement too? It is not just universal repeating. It is also circumstantial. The hardest circumstances, the greatest discouragement. Whatever happens that is so sad, it's, 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 it's deeper. And it's, it's, it's the pain is still there. And you know one thing I learned about discouragement too? You know what? It is contagious. 
How many of you have hang out with people or discouraged and then you get discouraged? You know what I'm talking about, right? The sun is out today. You wake up in the morning, you're singing, Sippity do da, sippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. And you see your neighbor is so discouraged and depressed, and all of a sudden your sip is gone from your do da day. <laughs> it's like a, a sickness that you caught, right? It's contagious. And here's really sad. Discouragement is deadly. There are some people when they get down, they stay down. Very few people came back out. Will it float or will it sink? So the disciples had this experience in their life. They were rowing against the wind. And Jesus is not there because Jesus is teaching them a lesson. Let me just tell you about Jesus, okay? So you don't get discouraged with Jesus. The way we learn here secular teaching is the teacher will teach you a lesson first, and then you will have a quiz, right? You will have an exam, right? The teacher will teach you a lesson, and then, okay, quiz time. Jesus' teaching is different. He will give you a quiz first, a test first, before teaching you the lesson. He will let you go to the trials of life. He will let you go to the fire. He will let you go to the devastation. And then Jesus will ask you, what did you learn? What are you learning? And this is a classic example in the time of the disciples. Jesus made them. They did not decide to go to the other side. It was Jesus who told, go to the other side. So Jesus was was in the midst of the, in control. And what happened while they were rowing to the other side? I want you to hear today how you can get unstuck and don't go down deeper and under. Number one, very important. Everybody read this with me. Come on, come on, read it aloud. One, two, three. You know the first word that came from Jesus' mouth when he was walking on the water? Everybody read this with me. Be of good cheer. Read it aloud. Be of good cheer. Jesus said this, guys, be of good cheer. Huh? We're suffering right now. We're struggling. And the tsunami is high and the winds are against us. Jesus, what are you talking about? Because normally, when we suffer, we have a bad attitude. Come on, somebody. We react negative, right? But listen to me carefully. It's okay. Sometimes we get depressed. It's okay. Sometimes we, we react bad. But don't stay there. Don't stay there because that is a breeding ground for bitterness. That's why the difference with people who get back up and those who stay down, they allow bitterness in their heart. I want you to read this verse with me. This is a danger for all of us. Let's read it together. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. How many of you need the grace of God? Amen. Oh, I cannot live a day without the grace of God. I need His mercy every day. Amen? Amen. You know what will disqualify you? Fall short of the grace of God? Let's read it together. Lest any root of bitterness because trouble. When you are bitter... You're not just hurting yourself. You're hurting the people around you. You know what I'm talking about, right? When you or someone is bitter in the family, it's not you suffering from bitterness. It spreads out. It licks. That's why God says, don't let bitterness spring up. It will cause you trouble for the rest of you. Not just for you. And you fall short of God's grace. So when Jesus came to the rescue, he said, hey guys, be of good cheer. Everybody say this with me, rejoice by choice. Rejoice by choice. Amen. It's a choice. I, I know you feel bad, but try to up, up your spirit and choose joy. Number two, Jesus said this, it is I. Everybody said, receive God's presence. After he said, be of good cheer, it is I. 
Because the disciples thought he was a ghost. Imagine you see a person walking on the water. You will freak out, right? You will freak out, right? Uh, you see a person walking on the water? And they thought it was a monster. They said it was a ghost and they freak out. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Here's the thing I want you to understand, Charisma. How many of you felt the presence of God in the mountaintops of your life? In the time of blessings. But did you know in the rough waters of your life, God is still with you. Come on, somebody. And sometimes He's more real to you during the times of your pain. And I want you to hear this, what God says. Let's read this together, Charisma. Then He climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. I was just wondering, imagining when Jesus walked to the waves of the sea, and then he climbed on the boat, and probably he, he waved a peace sign on the wind. <laughs> and the wind. <laughs> he said, <clears throat> where God's presence is, peace comes. You know that you know you feel the presence of God when you are at peace. Amen? I never seen a person having a panic attack experiencing God's presence at the same time, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? When you are having the presence of God, there's troubles around you. There's winds and the waves. But deep inside, whoa, you're that inner composure. And that is the presence of God. I want you to look fast forward when in heaven. This is the picture in heaven. Let's read it together. Also in the throne, there was looked like a sea of glass, clear crystal. Who's sitting on the throne? Jesus. What's surrounding the throne of Jesus? Sea of glass and clear. Have you ever been to a place when you look at the, you go to Hawaii or Caribbean, you look at the, the sea when there's no wind and there's no wave? It's like a sea of glass. You could see the corals, you could see the shells, you could see the fishes there. It's so calm and peaceful. That surrounds the throne of God in heaven. Meaning to say, where there is God's presence, there is peace. Amen, somebody? Amen. So we need to receive that presence of God as we go through this journey. Because it's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. There will be zigzags and ups and downs in life. Not all the time you're going to win. There are times you're going to lose and things like that. But what will make you down or go up? is you receive the presence of God. And not only that you receive the presence of God, number four, I want you to replace fear with faith. Everybody say, replace fear with faith. Replace fear with faith. What did Jesus say next? Let's read it together. One, two, three. Do not be afraid. Again, fear and faith cannot stay in one place. When fear knocks at the door of your life, send faith to open the door and fear will run away. How does fear comes to us? Fear comes by hearing and hearing and hearing bad news. That's why we get afraid. We hear and hear bad news. How does faith comes to us? By hearing and hearing, hearing good news, the Word of God. Some Christians are complaining, Oh, God is so silent in my life. I don't feel the presence of God. The question I'd like to ask is this. You cannot complain about the silence of God if your Bible is closed. Amen. It's like complaining to your friends you don't receive a text and your phone is dead. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Right? Amen. You complain the silence of God. Do you read the Bible? Open it. This is like a mouth. Open it. It will speak to you. Amen. But you go, oh, God is so silent. I don't feel His presence. Have you opened the Bible and received a promise of God up to your problem? Complaining about the silence of God and your Bible is closed is like complaining you don't receive a text because your phone is dead. Do not be afraid. Why? Let's read this together. This is awesome. This is from Calvin College. Let's read it together. Press on. Nothing can take place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than an unsuccessful man with talent. Genius will not. 
unrewarded. Genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated, derelicts. persistence and determination alone are the overwhelming power. Everybody saying, let's move on. Come on, let's press on. Amen. Believe God's power. And not only that, look at this. Look at the next slide with me, Charisma. I want you to rely on God's power. Why? Your God can walk on the water. Amen. That's how powerful your God is. He is not confined by gravity or buoyancy. He defies all scientific findings. He walks on the water. Let's read this together, Charisma. I want you to read this with me. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Everybody say fourth watch. <coughs> what is fourth watch? It is the Jewish time, re reckoning of time. Fourth watch means three in the morning until six in a.m. So if the disciples started rowing after six p.m., because that's sundown, the Jewish time, they, they're starting rowing now. Imagine from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m., they were going nowhere. They're going nowhere. And the wind was against them. And all of a sudden, 3 a.m., here comes Jesus. He came to them. How does this apply to us? Isn't it true, church? Sometimes you feel the loneliest moments of your life. The darkest moment, the saddest time is between the wee hours in the morning when you'll be awakened at night with cold sweats and fear grips into your life. Let me tell you this. During those times, just be open and call on Him. He will come to you. Amen, Amen somebody. He will come to you walking on the sea. This is a revelation for me that I learned long time ago and I live by this. What is over your head is under Jesus' feet. Let's read this together, Charisma. What is over your head? How did Jesus calm their fears? Jesus did not ride a boat. Hey, guys, transfer here. This is safer, bigger boat. Jesus walked on top of their fears. What are they afraid about? They're afraid of the winds. They're afraid of the waves. Jesus was stepping on those waves. Whatever is over your head is under the feet of Jesus. Sometimes you get confused. Oh God, how am I going to pay for this? Oh God, how am I going to have this? Lord God, how am I going to move on with this? Oh God, how this struggle will be done? And you keep on thinking, you get confused. Remember, what is over your head is under the feet of Jesus. And I speak this over to you today. Cancer is at the feet of Jesus. Your struggle is at the feet of Jesus. Your sorrow is at the feet of Jesus. Whatever you're going through, Jesus is stepping on it and He is in control and He is authority and He has power to change the situation in a bit because nothing is too hard for our God. What is over my head is under the feet of Jesus. So just keep rowing. Just keep sailing. Oh, everything will be taken care of. Come on, somebody. And last but not the least, I want you to understand this too. Remember God's promise. Everybody say this. Remember God's promise. What was the promise of God? Let's read it together. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples to get into the boat. So, go on ahead of him too. While he dismissed the crowd. What's the scenario? Jesus fed 5,000 people. And those 5,000 people want to, 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 to snatch Jesus and, and lead the revolution in Israel. And Jesus did not come for rebellion. So he hid away, he hid away to pray. And he, he told his disciples, go ahead. So probably he, the crowds will follow the disciples and Jesus is not with them. He dismissed the crowd. Here's the thing. How many of you know, this is Jesus like forcing the disciples. Everybody say Jesus made Jesus his disciples. disciples. How many of your parents? How many of you know sometimes you made your kids to eat vegetables? You know what I'm talking about? They don't want to eat the broccoli, right? But you eat it. 
you made your kids to eat vegetable. You, as, as if you are forcing it. Come on, open your mouth. This is good for you. It tastes like gummy bears. <laughs> and then you trick them, right? You made them eat vegetable. This is what Jesus did. He made the disciples go ahead. So listen to me carefully. It doesn't mean when, when you're Jesus, everything will be fine and dandy. Hello? Yes. It doesn't mean when you're obeying Jesus, everything will be smooth. Come on, somebody. Amen. There'll be rough times too. Come on, church. Amen. This is a perfect example. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, and then here comes a tsunami. But Jesus said, go ahead of him to where? Bethsaida. God did not say, go ahead and then go under in the middle of the lake. God said, go ahead and you will cross over to the other side. They forgot that promise and they panicked. So I challenge you today, what are some of those promises of God that you're holding on? Fight for it. Hold on to it. It hasn't happened yet, but believe it will come to pass. And this is one promise I want us to claim as we go to this journey with Jesus. Isaiah 43, 1 to 3 in the message version. Let's all read this together, Charisma. But now, the God who made you in the first place, the one who got you started, don't be afraid. I redeem you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am your God, your personal God, your Savior. I pay the huge price for you. Now, after Jesus stepped into the boat, he said, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. It is I. Wind stop, And they keep rowing. What happened? Look at the ending of the story. I want you to read this with me at the next slide. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. That is another word for Bethsaida. And anchored there. As soon as they get out of the boat, people recognize Jesus. They run throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever there he was. And wherever he went into the village, towns, countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of the globe. And all who touched it were, no wonder why the devil wants to kill them with these storms. Because at the end of the other side, marketplace, villages, towns, people will be waiting and Jesus will touch them and they will be healed. Charisma, let me just prophesy this to you. The attacks you're experiencing right now. Is the devil knows you're a threat to him. And the devil knows you're almost there. And he will try to distract you and distract you. But you don't listen to the voice of the devil. You keep pressing on. Even though you don't feel it, you keep fighting it. And fighting for your dreams. And staying for God. And living for God. And I tell you, blessings and favor are waiting on the other side. Come on, let's cross over the other side. The other side of depression is joy and happiness and fulfillment of life. The other side of barrenness is a multitude of children. The other side of the cross is resurrection. The other side of your, your defeat is victory overwhelming for you. Let's go to the other side. Don't get stuck. You know, if there's one person that Amazing story, true story. They made the movie of his biography of his life. How many of you heard or watched the movie Unbroken? Unbroken by, uh, directed by Angelina Julie. It's a true story of an uh, Italian-American immigrant named Louis Samperini. Let me just share this story. It's amazing. Only Jesus could do this. You know, this Italian-American migrated here to America he was always in trouble, juvenile court, juvenile jail time, because he's in trouble. 
he is so fast with his feet that he could go to the store and, 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 and get some booze and get some uh, candies and run away and no one could catch him. And then he ended up in the Olympic team as a runner. And during that time, the 1930s, during that Olympic 1930s in Berlin Olympics, he ran so fast that even Adolf Hitler saw him and said, I want to meet that guy. So Louis Semperini became the talk of the town. And he was preparing for the next Olympics to be happen in Japan. And we all know the sad story happened. World War II broke. And Louis Semperini's dream to go to Olympics did not happen. He ended up joining the U.S. Air Force as part of the, of the military. He was flying airplanes. And one day, his airplane crashed in the Pacific Ocean. Would you believe for 47 days in the middle of the ocean, he still survived. He lost 100 pounds. 47 days. 2,000 miles ended up in an island. But the problem is, this island is under Japanese regime. And there, he begins torture under the man called the bird. His name is Matsuhiro Watanabe. He's called the bird. He will really get into you, punch you, kick you, and just despise you and torture you and then will behead you. And through that moment of his time, the war stopped and the prisoners of war were released. But when he got back to America, Luis Samperino is a basket case. He said, every night I will have the dream about the bird. The bird torturing me, the bird killing me. He has suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And he became alcoholic. Then he got married. But his life was a mess. And one time in his dream, for the first time, he caught the bird and he was struggling. And he was really uh, uh, like a neck crank, uh, holding the neck of the bird. And then when he awoke, it was his pregnant wife. And one day, the wife invited him to attend a tent revival. There's a young preacher named Billy Graham. He was dragged by his wife because he doesn't want to go to church. He was alcoholic. POW basket case. And it so happened that night, Billy Graham was preaching John 3.16. All of a sudden, like a light turned on in his mind, and his heart was touched, and he came forward at the altar call. And then Billy Graham said, if you want to really make right with God, you surrender to him. And for him, as act of surrender is get rid of all those alcohol and his booze. And he said, in one day, my craving for that alcohol was gone. But still, that bitterness toward those Japanese torturers still in his heart. And you know what he said to Jesus? God, heal me from this pain. I don't want to be stuck with this anger and rage toward these people who, who torture me to death. Prosper me, Jesus. You know what? God bless him. And he became a missionary. You know, where's the first place he went back? He went back to Japan. And he went to the exact place. Now this time, those Japanese people who tortured him are now in jail because of war crimes. You know what Louis Semperini did? He preached the gospel. And he said, I forgive you because Jesus forgave me of my sin. And he made an altar call. And those torturers who tortured him came forward. And Louis Semperini said, it's only the love of God that flowed in my heart that I was able to embrace those people and love of them because Jesus transformed my life. True story. Unbroken. You could stay down in the dumps or you could channel that to get back up. Your God Jesus walks on water. The pain you're going through right now, turn it as a fuel, as a reset button to get back on your feet. 
you could look back and compare and go to the coulda, shoulda, woulda, and what if, or you could look ahead and dream again. I know this is a very strong message to all of us, but we need this. We need this. No one is exempt from the storms of life. But remember this. You have Jesus walking toward you. That's why I love Jesus. When he saw the 12 suffering, he is really a brother. He is not a bandwagon fan. He went to the twelves. That's why for those of you who are trying to sell your Seahawks jersey, <laughs> you are not a true fan. <laughs> we go down and we go up with the Seahawks. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and you cannot attend this church anymore if you... If you no, no, just kidding. <laughs> why, did, why did I end up there? <laughs> no, 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 just kidding, just kidding. What, what I'm trying to say, Jesus Christ is with this team not only during the high moments, not only during the victory parade. Jesus went with his team when they were struggling and dying at the middle of the lake. That's your God. He loves his team. He loves his people. He loves his 12. When they suffer, he suffered with them and he came to the rescue and picked them up and ushered them to the next Super Bowl. Oh, to the, to the next, to the next <laughs> island. Ushered them to the next island. And there were people lining up in the street and Jesus healed them. So today, whatever is putting you down today, Pain, suffering, job loss, broken heart. You have a choice. You could stay there or you could get back up. I want us to stand on your feet today. I want us to sing the song that we, they sang earlier. Spirit leads me where my trust is without border. I know some of us are going so from deep waters. Let's call on Jesus and He can rescue us.